Hello and welcome to Do the Right Thing, a weekly writing prompt podcast. I'm Matthias. And I'm Jarvis. Both of us love storytelling, but we know that sometimes it can be difficult to just sit down and write. So, one of us is doing a challenge. Each week we sit down. Our goal is to write a complete short story using three of four randomly generated words. Then we read the story that we wrote and talk about what we learned in writing it. We finish off by talking about stories written by you guys. Yeah, we're simply here to help you do the right thing. A Doof Media production. That's right. Now, if you've kind of noticed, uh, our naming con- convention for these episodes has switched up. Uh, and basically, we've decided to try and focus a-, a lot more on a specific aspect of writing that is brought about by uh, the discussion of our story along with the listener stories. Um, simply to just have each conversation that we have on this podcast a lot more geared towards something specific instead of general yeah so starting with this podcast um i mean we're starting with ourselves but for you guys uh, you guys can follow along as well we're we're going to theme each episode around a specific you know topic of writing we're going to start probably very very general this week we are doing um relationships right Mm -hmm. yeah relationship and character yeah, so, but topics in the future, uh, next week we're going to be doing action, right? So just focusing on bettering how we do action. And another week could just be character or voice or mm-hmm. setting um, or even just description. As we go forward and we, you know, exhaust these general topics, we'll probably go more and more detailed uh, as we all, uh, as a community, get better at writing. Exactly. And then one day we will talk about uh, theory and arrows, maybe. So that should be fun. <laughs> maybe. And how to, how to be actually good. Um, yeah, so... so uh, there's, there's no obligation if you're doing the right thing to, to follow along with these, but just, you know, consider, you know, uh, focusing on something to stretch your writing muscles and to just improve in whatever the aspect is this week. Or, or if you want to choose a different topic, of course, you can do that, too. So Exactly. Um, uh, the One of the best ways to actually grow as a writer, from what I've found, is whenever you do write, of course, focus on the story overall, but specifically focus on one aspect of it that you're probably lacking in. Like I know for me... Uh, I get caught up in a voice that I might use, and uh, also grammar has kind of eluded uh, me throughout all 21 years of my life, mm-hmm. so um, I think it's really good to focus on, on those things, and what we're trying to do here is kind of speak on them and provide any sort of aid and help that we've kind of gained from writing ourselves. Sure, um, but all right, let's get into the actual episode. So this week was Jarvis's story. Yes. Jarvis, um, the words were extraterrestrial, fee, lend, and sentiment. Which three did you choose? So I used all of them besides extraterrestrial. Uh, yeah, I, I could tell that was probably going to be the the hard one. I just, I just don't know how to fit that into a story. Um, without it being Paul the uh, the movie so yeah because it's it's not just uh, I mean some of our listeners uh, as we'll talk at the end had kind of clever solutions to it but it's like not just just a specific noun describing a specific thing right a, a, an alien it's also like a specific language that only is used in certain contexts right yeah. like if you're writing about aliens visiting you know uh medieval knights or whatever you can't use the word extraterrestrial right Mm-hmm. Um, and even like doing it very far in the future, extraterrestrial just like feels wrong. Like if humans are in space, so it's like it has to be modern times. And I feel that the like golden era that you could possibly use use the, this word uh, would be like the Men in Black esque era. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I guess would be fifties. <laughs> Yes, I think basically you, if you're gonna use the word extraterrestrial, you kind of have to be like 1930s onward. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, but yeah, so so I used uh, the others. I used uh, lend in the past tense, which is fine. We can alter the the word slightly. Um, and yeah, so uh, this week was pretty uh, easy in, in, in actually writing uh, since finals is all done. I was able to actually come back to my good old home of Pflugerville, Texas. Um, and just, you know, in, enjoy the family re, a uh, recharge and focus on the sort, the sort of stories that have been kind of on my mind for quite some time. So, uh, for this week, again, I wrote in the world of, um, I don't know what to call it, but it's the world with the floating flower gods, sky blue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and 
I know my first title for it was was Psychedelic Wizard, but I realized that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, all, all our titles are kind of dumb, right? I yeah. mean, you're not submitting it to a uh, to a journal, so like the I mean, the way I I kind of view this is at the very least it's just like what the folder name is for me. Mhm. Yeah, I mean, I have a bunch of nonsense titles. Like my, like my most serious work I called it the Princess Diaries just because it was like about a princess, but it's not uh, a diary at all, and it was supposed to be about intrigue and stuff. So okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, what, I find when it comes to coming up with, with a title, uh, that's I mean, even in the pro professional field, that's always last, and half of of the time, um, the author doesn't even decide what, what the title is. Um, yeah, so. I don't know. I, I I try not to really focus on it that much, but uh, for this, uh, I guess entry into the story, I I definitely de- uh, decided to focus a lot more on character and specifically the the connection uh, of the main character to his professor, um, because in the events of this story, uh, the main character is becoming the professor's Boswell. Uh, and a Boswell is basically a trusted advisor and friend that follows a- another along their journey and typically uh, writes down what uh, what happens. Um, sure. So, for instance, uh, in Sherlock Holmes, Watson is Sherlock Holmes' bo- a Boswell, right? Is it is this like is this a word you came up with? No, this is a real word. Oh, cool. Th- yeah. Do you know what like setting it comes from? Like I mean, what place in the world? I think it comes from Sherlock Holmes, honestly. Wait, really? Yeah. Well, well at least that's the first place that I saw it. Um and I know it's really old and no one uses it. Hold on, let me actually look it up. Boswell. Uh, Boswell. Uh yeah, it's as defined by James, apparently. Uh, James Boswell. Yeah, uh, 1740 through 1795. It's a Sc- it's a Scottish biographer and a diarist. So I, I I guess I assume there that James Boswell just like did a lot of biographies of life of a usually famous contemporary, as the definition says. Yeah. yeah. So ah, oh, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah. So uh, well, all right. When I when I first read read that word, I was definitely intrigued by what that meant, and found a way to I guess implement it into this overarching story. So I don't know. I had fun. All right, let's get into your story. I guess is there anything else we need to know before uh, you start reading it? I'm excited to read it, and hopefully, it is received well. I hope so too. Let's go. My title for this one is my travels as Boswell, Homestead in the Grove. Professor burned the midnight oil far off in the grove, past the cobbled path, after the little sign we built together, Homestead Grove, books and lessons, and between two writhing Enoke trees. He walked with a quickness and a fresh limp that left his Achilles locked around his ankle. After our conversation, he left much for me to think about and I couldn't help but wonder if his snail-like saunter in the bright light of Skybloom's rest, along the glimmered pink pebbles lining of the road, was purposeful, giving me a few seconds longer to fortify sureness in this new stage in our lives. No, it couldn't be age. Even if his hair reached a white beyond pale, he wasn't slow by any means, yet never really hurried anywhere. Professor was the kind of person who'd stop a hike to drink in the tweet of the cardinal he'd call Red Robins, or the kind of person to take a smoke break whenever he's not talking and perch himself upon some vantage point to look stoic and statuesque. You know, to keep up the appearance that something important's buzzing around in that brain. It was childlike, his eagerness and lust for life and that night he was hell-bent on spending as much time out there before tomorrow's departure as possible. And, from my midnight foggy window, as any perspective Boswell's supposed to, I became the voyeuristic audience for his midnight exploits. No more than an hour before he wandered off, I presume the worryful stir downstairs was him rifling about the drawers. The homestead matron built their self was creaky and yes, sometimes carried the voices and footsteps of visitors past. 
but there is a clear distinction between sensory brought about by apparitions and the careless clatter of shattered glass and ill-greased cabinets. From the head of my bed, placed just past the lower bow of the semi-spherical window, I perceived no heavenly glow from under my bedroom door, so I figured he was drunk. This was for sure. Professor's night vision was impeccable, and, when he's drunk, those two rosy eyes are sharper than the nose of a bloodhound. There was mild festivities the day prior, a sort of going-away, come-back-soon party Matron decided to throw to wish her life partner and his apprentice off for the season. So no one would have been surprised if Professor wandered the rooms in search of stale mead to gargle. But why the clattering? Surely a man with 40-40 night vision wouldn't throw round pots for effect. And then it hit me, as the alertness brought on by his blunder gained purchase. That Professor was old 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 even if his skin remained taut his mind was an artifact half his references still shrouded in the old doctrine so old that he remembered the mass rejection of eastern technology and the subsequent shunning of its people and their influences when a dog gets old his most keen senses are the first to go professor taught me this as we gain age we do gain wisdom but our greatest faults show their wear and things once thought reliable now have a hindrance. Or he would say something like that, as an excuse to why he left a candle burning overnight. Or he'd turn his torching of supper into a lesson of making do with the energies the lands give you. His phrases and sayings always residing between joking, jovial, and unnecessarily poignant. The wear of the wood told me he was shrugging up the stairs. A worryful or loving drunk professor is. When he check in on myself or Cretan, the only employee they've kept on, to make sure our slumber was sound, the clap of his grizzly man foot interrupted the deepest of sleeps. But that night he had half the mind to creep around after his little house show downstairs. The hall still was noisy with his stupor, however. Seemingly, he stopped by every painting the mahogany-laced corridor was riddled with, remarked at the breaststrokes, quite slurred, and mimicked comical conversations you might hear at any art gallery, the strangest places his mind goes. His professorisms must have rubbed off, because whenever he entered, I'd play dead, let him come into the room, and investigate between every plank of wood for critters and hordes. I'd stifle my laugh when he peered through my big bag of herbs atop the adjacent drawer to find my pre-rolls. He sniffed my little addiction I brought from home, gag, and placed them back, as if he wasn't trying to swipe one nightly. Amused with his childlike antics, Professor would drop his giddy to check on me earnestly, lean in close and feel for the air above my lips. After a second, he was satisfied would pat me on the head or, on chilly nights, tuck his little twenty-something apprentice in before making his way outside. On the night in question, this was all true, but where I drift off after his departure, I couldn't bring myself to turn off. The soon journey left bees about my thoughts, of worry and excitement, bittersweet as the day before always is. Whether Father Time forgot about me, or it was that scholarly insomnia all the prophets were stricken with i decided to make use of my time and work on our summoning pouches so in the pitch dark of a midnight grove my toes and fingers found their way out of bed around my ill-kept bedside area that being the only blemish in my pristine room mind you to find the jagged dial of the rusted flood lantern in the far corner of the room before he left for his excursion, Professor filled my lantern, so with just a spark, the blue gas filled the room with light. Then I went through my drawers for odds and ends of old glowstone I used on my journey here. The search, sadly, yielded withered fruit. The stones were far more broken and dim than I remembered, practically white smoldering dust, but it was enough to do something to the dark. With a milky hue about my room, I pulled the plain steel bunker chest from underneath my bed and flicked its latches. 
That chill from the buffered steel was like a lightning you wouldn't believe. Her contents were important, yes, but the excitement of study was so very alive in these lands. Inside the bunker were four previous pouches I prepared. Two were dipped in striker berry, quite rare, but Professor lent them to me as a four-year anniversary, which gave them a golden color. The others were plain burlap, dusted with Macedonian ash and a bit of blood for effect. Next to them was an original copy of the Big Book of Summons, bound in iron ore and kissed by Skybloom herself. On its face, the divids that spelled out its title were still slick with golden ink, and, no matter how much it bled, kept its color through even the wettest of storms. This was my assignment from him. To fortify understanding of the book, even he is alluded by. It was a test, he said, to see if I was worthy enough to become his Boswell, a trusted partner and Bardus scribe. It was laughably easy to see through, however, probably purposefully, knowing him. Professor wasn't someone who dwelled on worth or wrote memorization. No, he just needed an excuse to keep me his rosy apprentice, who he can laugh and joke with as if we're some sort of surrogate siblings. The job or role of Boswell is less fun and adventurous as an apprenticeship, even though the granting of a Boswell is facilitated by a grand journey. No moment within that journey can be spent on anything but research and growth in the energies. I'd liken it to the signage of a deed, and the realization that property taxes and mortgages are far more involved than you thought. I flipped to the effect section of the book. The pages were pristine, which was to be expected from a text of its make, and landed on my latest bookmark, The Black Noise Band. Professor must have caught a whiff of busy work, because his drunken stupor found his way to my door once more. And, where I thought he'd bust in thinking my room was the chamber, he tapped twice. Tip-tap. So delicate I thought it was a, a mistake. I quickly tidied up. My work always looked messy, even if I had just started. And said, Come in. In a respectable voice. Foot first he slunked into the room, slightly sweaty and grinning as if he'd just entered a brothel. I wondered if he waited outside for the perfect moment, if he saw through my horrible acting, and decided that since that day was special, he'd drop this little game we play for a moment. I'll show him. His hand knocked the door frame. The thick rings gifted to him by his colleagues chipped the paint. Ooh, sorry. Been a long night. I looked up from my work to my pinkish professor who was rubbing his grubby fingers along the chip. I can tell. Emptying the cabinet before we leave? I asked with a smile, matching his glee, but also inquisitive about the slight strangety of his actions. Al Shai likes to smoke more than drink, and for our travels I need to... a, a clear-headed... I... I can't look up at the night fog and wonder how long the meat'll keep. So I shouldn't pack the beef eater, obviously pulling his leg. No, no, no. He held out a hand to stop me. Giving in to the force, he stumbled his way further in, just past the doorframe. A second trail by for him to compose himself. A clearer head doesn't mean we can't unwind. <laughs> he stopped abruptly, looked around my wooden room, to the still bunker and crumpled papers, eyeing the glowstones and pouches. What you brewing? Some burnables. I palmed one of the pouches, gently, so as to not knock off the ash, and held it out. Professor took the offering, mindfully walking through my litter to find a seat on my bed before taking it. Ah, hash and herb. I see you're stunned up on black noise? As his eyes perused the pouch, the fragile twine that kept it all together, and the tiniest ink, Scratches, donning the concoction with a name. His head pointed towards the book. Yes, if the burnage summons the right beings, their songs can invigorate us with longevity and even send any bandit into confusion. With the right fee, of course. Of course, bound in blood, 
as all good summons respect. Respect. Professor grinned, his little foreigner finally learning. He made his home in my bed, buried himself under the plush comforter my home was known for. He peeked out from under my pillow. Only his large red eyes and rosy coffee face emerged from the mound of plush. He'd been there for a while, watching quietly as I peered over the book. This was his teaching style. After a bit of observation, he'd step in and spell out all the good you did along with the bad. I pride myself even now by leaving no room for his critique. Unprompted, he spoke again, the slur so close to God. Are you sure you want to become my Boswell? We'd all have to be a bit more serious around here. Ah, so no more late nights where you drink Matron and I under the table. At that moment, I was waiting for him. To say something to excuse my lack of work. Also, what was the point of a late night session if not to converse with a like mind? And, no more day hikes round the mountains and groves, speaking on life and wonder. I'd have to be a scholar again. Pa! And you would be on your way. Sounds like what I came for, Professor. Professor smiled, his dumb grin infectious with joy. Well then, Boswell, since you're more of a partner than an apprentice, call me by my given name. He'd built up in my heart. A first name basis meant acceptance in these lands like a study visa in a foreign country that leads to not only citizenship, but community and family. I held back sentiment, though I know I didn't have to. Thank you, Alhem. I am eager and belated to become your Boswell. Still using a subservient voice, Alhem sat up from the bed, tossing the comforter over my bunker and work. How now, Boswell? I can't have a friend walking on eggshells. Look towards me as a uh, character in one of those novels, aware of their faults and comforted by them. The legitimacy of my work is dependent on your written account, so let's be earnest in our partnership. I'm sorry, I, I said without thinking. Quickly, I retorted. I mean, thanks. No thanks necessary. Just pack the beef eater. His old man laugh bellowed throughout the homestead. And, after a few more topics brought laughter to the night, he left to spin what little light there was left, outside amongst Mastodon. Yeah, so uh, this is a uh, fantastic, another little entry into the Sky Bloom uh, series, um, which really... um, I mean, so I, I think the focus for the series has always been the setting and the relationship between... Um, this main character and their apprentice, right? In the first one, I think you did, like, they meet. In the second one, they go on a little, like, trek together and see something. But it's always, like, them interacting. Um, and so this one is kind of like a, a reflection. Um, yeah. I think the way that you, you wrote this, it's kind of... Uh, Al Shim is the main character, right? Yeah. Well, so at first, through writing it, I was like, yeah, Al, Al Shim is the main character. But I've kind of figured out that most tales when it comes to like this idea of of boswell is that the main character is not the person writing it but the person they're talking about sure so i don't know i i that might change in the uh, in uh, in the future as i kind of explore this this idea but in this one yes al al shum is the main character like the the jack caraway right he's not exactly the main character he's actually more of a minor character but he's the one telling the story Mm -hmm. yeah i I more meant like he's the he's the viewpoint yes 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 yes. um he's the the eye yeah so so al shum is um kind of just reflecting on his relationship and um just the the professor in in general um who we kind of understand as a like wise but like often drunk and definitely getting old <laughs> um but he's he's friendly as well kind of guy yeah yeah and it kind of seemed like through this whole thing um it like definitely doesn't feel like an apprentice master uh relationship from the beginning and as we go it, it really seems like they're more just like friends and yeah. then at the end, you have um, uh, the professor kind of like just sleeping in Alshim's bed, which I was like, <laughs> yeah. that's adorable. Like an old man, like all curled up in blankets. Yeah. Um, the giant plush like, of his homeland. Yeah, that's not the way that I would usually 
if you the like wise old mentor like Gandalf wouldn't do that but I guess maybe Yoda would <laughs> Maybe maybe Yoda would, yeah. And I think that's just due to me having knowledge of what a typical apprenticeship like this is and just kind of trying to subvert that but also follow along that path. Uh, Trying to make it a little bit more realistic because, I mean, so they live in this place named uh, uh, Homestead Grove Books and Lessons, which I hopefully that suggested that uh, Alhim might take on uh, apprentices quite often, but there's only a total of three people in there. So this closeness kind of breeds this this new family. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you finish off by w- with the story with um, Weldon Boswell, since you're more of a partner than an apprentice, uh, call me by my given name, which is kind of like the, the theme. That, like it, it feels like the natural conclusion to this train of thought that this uh, Alsham is, is having. Yeah. I mean, they, like, respect each other, but it's, like, super, like, just chill kind of um, relationship. And Alsham, like, does, you know, uh, kind of revere the professor a little bit, but it's also, like, not that much. Yeah. So what else were you aiming to do with the story in regards to their relationship? Uh, in regards to their relationship, beyond just trying to build it, since since the story is told from the perspective of Al Alsham, I wanted to give a general view of what, of how Alhim kind of acts, building up this older man who doesn't really look that old, but he is graying, uh, who seems to just enjoy life and is not really all that concerned about deep, like teaching that much and is more concerned with living with the energies that the lands, that the lands give you. And I kind of did that by making a good portion of it fairly comical uh, in how Al Shum recounts uh, how the how the professor is always messing up, you know, leaving a candle burning Mm -hmm. overnight, uh, breaking glasses down uh, downstairs, uh, maybe even walking into his room thinking it's the chamber. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, this this whole thing was just me figuring out how their relationship really works um, mm-hmm. along with uh, certain uh, backstories and dis- uh, descriptions. Like be- before this, I didn't know uh, Alhim's eyes were red. Mm-hmm. I didn't know uh, he was a dark-skinned man, um, but now I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that's something that comes across in this is that it, it does feel, it does like meander a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I mean, it kind of comes across that the, the point of this is not necessarily to tell the story about this specific scene. It's more you looking and and exploring like what interactions have these people had and and things like that. I I think that does come across. Yeah. If this was part of a larger work, this was that this would definitely be a epilogue, right? Uh because it's not to the actual conflict. It's not to the the journey. It's the night before. Um, mm-hmm. And also something I was really trying to do, uh, again, going off of this idea of this story being told very personally from uh, this one person's perspective, I try to to characterize uh, all of the uh, writing and the voice as much as, as possible. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely stepping out outside of a lot of choices that, that I would make and trying to Fit, trying to figure out how someone in this world in this main character's position would write about their professor yeah that's that's a a, a really cool thing right of like you, putting your your mindset into someone else's mm-hmm. um so do, do you remember like some specific instances where you would have phrased something a different way well definitely in the beginning mm-hmm. pro uh professor burned the midnight oil out in the grove and I think one one thing that, that I really did was I went through and I deleted a lot of words. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just like things that I would normally add on to the end of words. Um, and I used a lot of shortens. I switched up tenses. Yeah, I definitely adopted a totally different way of like uh, telling a story. Like I know one huge mm-hmm. thing is I... Uh, went through and I just switched up the the order of sentences in, in a lot of paragraphs just to kind of build this not only this this voice but this 
new flow that I'm kind of working with when it comes to telling the story. Yeah. 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 Very, very train of thought. Very uh, diary-esque. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But on the idea of the relationship, one problem that I, that I, that I definitely ran into is when it comes to the dialogue. I wasn't sure how much to add and, and how long for it to really go. I mean, of of course, when I was writing this, I super ran out of time, uh, which is, I mean, you can definitely tell it's like a, what, a 2,200 word story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but one, but one part that I spent a, a lot of time on was that dialogue and finding, mm-hmm. trying to find a even mix between the, the actions and the feelings and the lines of a uh, dialogue. And that's, yeah. and that's always really been kind of a uh, issue with me, right? Because on a first go through, I always just write out all of the dialogue um, because I start off with writing a, a lot of um, screenplays. Um, and that's just kind of how I operated. Yeah. Um, so you're saying that the dialogue was difficult to write this time or because I wasn't totally sure how much character I would bring across in the dialogue without it being bogged down by that, without spending too much time on this uh, on this uh, conversation. So, like, that's one one reason why I added a like time added a uh, time skip halfway through this uh, conversation because at first I I wrote like another page of them talking while uh, Al him is drunk. But then I realized, oh, mm-hmm. this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that what you what you put here is it's pretty good. It kind of is just like a snapshot of how they interact. Um, I like the uh, call and, and call back to the the should I shouldn't pack the beef eater, and then at the end I will do pack the the beef eater. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So I I, I mean probably that page probably did need to be cut uh, oh, if it didn't definitely. go anywhere but like i think what you've left here is is really uh good i like you we can just tell um they kind of predict each other and uh, that um the professor is like in charge but you know he's he's pretty lax about everything um so yeah i i think it worked really well yeah and, and it's definitely finding that that balance i feel mm-hmm. um between what what they're saying and how the, how you describe them saying it, uh, and I mean mm-hmm. that that all works towards building that closeness between two two people and also really understanding how they interact. Uh, I know one thing that that we uh, talk, that we used to talk about very often is the idea of characters being alive in your mind, right? And, mm-hmm. and how for some writers that is very true, and and for others it it isn't. And yes, just just because your characters don't feel like real people in your mind doesn't mean like there's something wrong with you. Um, it just means that you don't really could you might not connect to it on that level. But I know for uh, for me, uh, through through writing this, uh, these characters definitely did feel a little bit alive, um, and I acted to try and capture a moment in this night where they are conversing with each other. You know, it's it's like mm-hmm. that a uh, very typical exercise where you take two characters and you sit them down in a in a coffee shop. Yeah. I, I think this was a, a really good exploration of that with these these characters. I think you did a good job here. Yeah, is is there anything else uh we want to say before we move on? Um No, I uh think that is it for this one. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's move into the listener story section. Um, so we're going to talk about five listener stories. Of course, we wish that we could do every single one, but we just don't have the time. Um, and of course, if you didn't get selected this week, don't worry. Um, every single time you do the right thing and or uh, leave uh, two comments in the Reddit thread, your chance of getting selected goes up. So the stories for this week are by No Goodbye, Haunt of the Heron, Zakatigi, Kasubalu V2, 
and Will Bay. And of course, as usual, we are going to spoil all these stories, and they were fantastic. Mm-hmm. So uh, please go to the Reddit thread, uh, read up these stories, um, you know, read read their their twists and turns, and then come back and, and listen to the rest of this because uh, it won't be as enjoyable as if you um, didn't read them. Exactly. So, so the first one we're, we're going to talk about is by Zakatiki with The Interpreter part five yeah so this is the uh fifth part in their series we've basically like we i think we did the first one the third one and now we're doing the fifth one so we just keep skipping parts (laughs) skipping every Um, other one yeah but just to just to summarize uh from the stuff from before basically we are uh in this woman alexis's perspective as she's uh kind of interviewing a uh sort of magical criminal prisoner rebel terrorist kind of i mean <laughs> bad guy the, the state does the point is that the state does not like uh thomas bale mm-hmm. but um as we go over this conversation it's kind of clear that it's not entirely bale or or his community's fault so in, in this specific part we're kind of in the middle of a of a conversation that was going on in, in the last section so uh basically um bale is kind of setting the scene of how uh, his uh, community uh, was was taken in by the the collective. Um, essentially, I, I I think I believe it went that way. Basically, over time, just increasingly had their their rights taken away and sub- subjugated. I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I probably would have used oppressed in a sense because mm-hmm. you know, as you said, over time their rights are <laughs> slowly stripped and yeah. stripped. And, and stripped down to, like, where, where they are now. Right. Um, and so, basically, uh, the community kind of did a... The, the, the town crier kind of made a, a mistake. Yeah. Um, there was a little fight, and uh, Bale kind of spoke out against, like, the, the crackdown against the community, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and was kind of turned into a criminal. So it's it, so basically over the course of this conversation, we, we, we see that Bale is actually like a very sympathetic individual and has a sympathetic cause. And, and we kind of see that through Alexis, even though we know that she's actually on behalf of the, that government, mm-hmm. um, it's clear that she's kind of um, listening to him and, and following along with his uh, narrative um, and kind of uh, being turned away from the bad side, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And we kind of end with this really nice, uh, poignant ending. Um, Bale just being sad that he's here, but the real sadness is what's going on out there, yeah. basically. So I really liked the characterization in the dialogue in, in this one. I mean, since we're talking about the a uh, relationship within the, the story, the, the dialogue worked really well to uh, setting up all of these characters and how they view the other person uh in in sight of all these things that 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 are happening to them Mm -hmm. and yeah i just really liked how we spent a lot of time in this one place just really uh uh, focusing on the back and forth be between these these characters as they're both telling their own version of the story so really good yeah, uh, I, and and there's there's some cool stuff with relationships kind of happening here. There's a relationship being built up between these characters over the course of this conversation. We see Alexis sympathize more and more. Um, so yeah, I think this is a really really cool story. Yeah. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is by No Goodbye, which was called Last Flight. So we we start off with this uh, conversation between these two women, uh, Meredith and Jin. Um, in this, this this romantic kind of conversation, uh, Jin is in the Python suit, uh, which we understand is probably some very high technological, um, biomechanical kind of uh, suit uh, to fight back against the aliens that are destroying humanity. Um, and Jin is basically going to fly off and do their 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 final stand mm-hmm. um, and try to save humanity. I'm here. Uh, but yeah yeah i'm back yeah <laughs> and uh Jin is kind of you know reflecting on how she's not doing this for humanity she's doing this for meredith mm-hmm. because she loves her which is a really yeah yeah it comes across really clearly how much like these two characters care about each other uh and then it ends with meredith's point of view as we see Jin fly away and meredith is just upset that when Jin says, just let me your prayers, we'll make it through this, we doesn't include uh, Jin. It's supposed to be Meredith and everyone else. Yeah. And yeah, she's not 
protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. Is it planning on coming back? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, this this story, of course, has really great world uh, world building. Yeah, they, the writer is doing a really great job of setting up these stakes, um, especially with with the one line that, that I really like that says something to the effect that they've been in this world uh, in this war longer than they've existed. Right, which definitely sets up uh, the stakes very well. Uh, also, this yeah. uh, connection between these these two is really well fortified, um, especially since the main character is willing to uh, sacrifice her herself not for the whole of humanity, but for this person that she she loves. So, really, really great. Yeah, uh, we we set the, the the world stakes, but we put the stakes in a more personal place mm -hmm. than just like humanity. So, the next story is by Kasubalu V two. With an innkeeper's daughter, Magic Rings. Uh, so this is the, I think, second entry. No, second? Third? Third. It's, um, if it is the second entry, if, if it is the third entry, it's the second entry in, like, one particular character's storyline. Yeah. Um, so basically in the last one, we saw a hedge wizard, um, hedge mage, I forget the term exactly, <laughs> Um, Edge man. having made a magic tome and uh, caught by inquisitors, but not before throwing the book into a basket, uh, which I kind of forgot uh, until uh, three quarters of the way through. And then we kind of get that revealed and it's a cool little twist because I, I had forgotten um, to be like, oh, so that's what this story is. That was that was cool. Um but uh, we start off with these uh, two characters, uh, uh, Kara and Oswald. Um, Kara is carving the sign for uh, the family tavern, and uh, she's borrowing Oswald's knife, and, and that's just uh, some interaction there. Uh, her sister shows up, um, and they go uh, walking somewhere. Along the way, uh, we just get more description of like what kind of uh places is what is their tavern like mm -hmm. um and it's more like just a, like a, a feeling kind of sense than specifically like what things look like yeah. which is nice and then most of the way through uh she comes across an older lady selling baskets it's very expensive they they haggle uh, and then when she gets it apparently there's something in it and it is that magic tome from the uh time before <gasps> uh which like i said was a fun twist i i really like that that um callback i, I like that i had forgotten about it uh, and so it was still a surprise. And she opens it, and uh, the name of the book is The Book of Extra Terrestrial, which I thought was a fun way to use uh, <laughs> yeah. that word. Yes. I think that's a really good job. So yeah, it was a yeah, it's a fun read. Um, I, I I really like the the relationships that are being developed as a like first chapter of a story. There's not like a ton of like stakes here. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's okay. I mean, it's like a couple thousand words into the story. It's kind of like, the the farm boy's normal day before we get to like pulling the sword from the stone yeah, or whatever exactly it's uh go to the shop and sell these these cows and he comes back with the magic yes beans. yes exactly i think that's a that's a good way to put that so encountering the supernatural yes yeah, so it's it, it, i mean it's a lot of fun um I, i'm excited to see what happens i i assume car is probably going to learn how to do terrible magics yeah. and uh that's gonna be very I i'm sure antics will ensue mm -hmm. um hijinks and mm -hmm. probably horrible things but that's that's what makes things fun exactly so. yeah i mean yeah. yeah i'm really looking forward to the next entry not only is is the world building ramping up but uh the connection between these these two characters is definitely being fortified and mm -hmm. i think one one thing that i am really really looking forward to is seeing how this relationship is going to be tested because one huge chief thing about setting up any kind of connection is that us as, as a reader probably has the expectation that there will be that testing moment you know like in any buddy comedy uh there's how they normally are then there is the conflict and then there's always that one moment at like 30 minutes before the the movie ends where yeah. like one of them's like well you know what i don't want to be your partner anymore and yeah, he's like, well, and then I the storm don't need off. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then then they realize that they do need each other, and then they team up, and it's and great. then it's a yeah. rousing ending. So yeah, I am definitely looking forward to uh, seeing how that kind of unfolds. 
So the next story we're going to talk about is by Haunt of the Heron, uh, with the story named Last Civilization. Um, what a what a fun story! Yeah, also, this one. Uh, I love how the title is in like forty seven point font <laughs> and bold. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's. Um, I don't know exactly how to do that in Reddit, but yeah, it's. it's yeah, fun I didn't know you could do that in Reddit. Doing anything yes. on on Reddit is a thousand times more difficult than doing it in Google Drives. Reddit's formatting sucks, mm-hmm. and it's kind of a bummer because. Like you could do a lot of fun things with formatting in like I mean just a normal any word processor, yeah. uh, just like using italics in a different way or just the way that the page looks does affect how your your piece reads, exactly, right? Yeah. If you squeeze the margins, it, your story might read a little bit faster paced because you're skipping through lines faster. Because yeah. uh, I know one a uh, one story that I did a couple of of weeks ago uh i i really messed around with its format you know like having certain certain lines uh on the left margin in the middle on the right you know kind of get that Mm -hmm. cascading feel uh that is very common in uh, in a lot of play scripts when people are talking at the uh, same time uh but you just can't have that (laughs) in the reddit comics section which i get i mean it is a forum website that's supposed to just be common yeah right so yeah uh so that's that's just a a too bad thing like multiple times i have copy pasted um, my story into a comment and then it you know gets rid of all the italics so I have to like go back and re-add the italics um, and usually I just and forget too so. <laughs> yes uh, but all right let's get into the yes. story so this is a great um, kind of like uh, the last answer the last question kind of story oh, love that. Um, no a lot problem. of fun reminds me of a particular chapter in uh, at death's end by um, uh, six in mm. um the from the three body trilogy so we have this uh orchestral mind uh named i already told you my des- designation which is just a fun it shows you kind of the personality and so it's basically like a super ai in this universe kind of like n- near closer to the heat death of the universe mm-hmm. uh, a super the the last civilization the super civilization has constructed these ai minds to basically harvest all of the energy possible in this section of of space um like there's the sky is all black there are no more stars um and it's going to harvest all these to as efficiently as possible make civilization last as long as possible before the final end which will be trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of years in the future but it is a final Mm -hmm. end and so there's this 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 thing happens where uh two uh dead uh dwarfs smash into each other and a final star uh ignites and it's going to last um it it is voted to become the sole beacon of light for the next hundred trillion years i don't think i don't know if uh stars even last that long (laughs) so it, it just uh, as a as a small thing but uh, so the last star um ignites and the civilization um which normally is trying to be as efficient as possible because it's just trying to stave off the end and have a society for as long as possible decides that this is like a poignant thing uh we see kind of life cycle here uh some planets form and then life forms on that planet and then that life actually goes sentient and we see the civilization kind of rise and maybe they should be like hidden away and like made to be ignorant of the true nature of the universe which said it's dying Mm -hmm. but in in the end they don't and the civilization civilization kind of grows up and then um is kind of taught what's gone on and it gets absorbed into this last civilization it it seems like in a a peaceful way but it's also like kind of tragic that now there is only one thing left there is no other that people can be hopeful about um it's kind of this this big tragedy it like it ends in a place where like yes for a very, very long time, uh, for for a time longer than time has existed already, um, this civilization will continue relatively happy. But that end is going to come. Yeah. And um, I already told you my designation is... Um, we, we, we don't... It doesn't say that it's bummed out, but we can kind of understand that. I absolutely love this one. It's uh, filled with this sense of dread. Uh, and it is pointing towards this end of, of everything, which is uh insane to to really think about and yeah um similar to to what you said previously it does remind me a lot of the last question um especially in the way that that the story is is being told very broad from this vaguely a of from this vaguely alien uh perspective but of course within this one it isn't as as hopeful as the ending of the last question 
Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, I, I forgot to no. mention, but the, the last question, the last answer to uh, sci-fi short stories by uh, Isaac Asimov, and they're they're pretty good yeah, reads. Um, solid reads. And yeah. I don't want to spoil them. They're like, um, real, like, I want to say 12 pages for at least the, the last question. I haven't read the last answer. Yeah, they're pretty short. They're, they're, they're worth a read. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this is really evocative. I love the, the numbers that are, are put here. <laughs> There's four quadrillion or maybe it's just a quadrillion, I don't remember the exact number, but there's uh, a quadrillion lives in this last civilization, and they're just trying to live as long as possible. And I, I, the, the main tragedy here is that the orchestral minds kind of guess that if they had been one trillion years, if they had been created one trillion years earlier, they might have been able to save this universe and, and figure out some way to, to go on indefinitely. But they were just born too late. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so yeah i think this is a really good uh yeah. this is a great ca- feeling cosmic tragedy here. yeah cosmic tragedy that's a good point yeah um all right uh the last story we're going to talk about this week is by will bay with a uh, relinquishment so uh the, the story um is uh pretty interesting we are in one woman's perspective uh named uh nilu far which it's a fun name <laughs> um she is uh, speaking with a, a, a lawyer, is kind of just giving her a speech as she's basically getting ready to uh, have an, uh, an abortion. Um, and she, we kind of get her relationship with... It, it's interesting how we actually did get a, a lot of stories about relationships, uh, even though we didn't announce this at all. <laughs> um, she has a relationship with a, a guy named Tim, and she's basically you know gone on her own to do this because... Uh, she knows that like Tim would like kind of do anything for her and put himself in a bad situation um, to, to to help her either way, and she just she kind of doesn't want to do that to him. And it's you know it, it's really really kind of a sweet kind of thing. If I were to critique a little bit, it's a little bit hard to see exactly like what she loves mm-hmm. about him. But I, I guess the statement is Tim was in love with her. You know, it, it kind of seems like he loves her more than she yeah, loves him, but she does like him. Yeah, or not, yeah, just basically that her feelings aren't as intense as his, I think. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it, and we see a lot of stuff about the relationship. I think it's, it's really well characterized. Uh, but in the in the plot, basically, uh, close, very close to the end, um, we, we've kind of gotten these small hints that something weird is going on. Um, and then they... Uh, put her into the next room. They've kind of warned her that there's going to be no anesthesia. They strap her down, and then the nurses pull off their masks, revealing smiles that are far too wide. (laughs) Um, And the lawyer opens his mouth, and there's too many teeth, and they all, like, bite down on her, and there's blood, and she tries to scream, but she can't, and it's it's pretty horrible. Um, Kind of reminds me of... um, Well, I guess it'd be a spoiler, but something in the Magnus archives. Um, There's this great uh, callback at the very beginning. She's like so bored. She's staring at the motes of dust coming off the ceiling fan. And at the end, she's watching a mote of dust float across the room. And it's, oh, it's dark. Uh, I absolutely love the switch from the mundanity of of life to this to this horrific scene. Uh, and I think it's handled very well uh, in the sense to where there isn't a, a whole bunch of hints that, that this is the end of this. But when it does happen, it's so surprising and, I don't know, done really, really well to where towards the end I was like, wow, was it worth it, right? And also, you know, yeah. some some red flags definitely went off when there was a lawyer present. <laughs> I, I think uh, the stakes are really set here. Like we, we kind of see with this whole thing that like this is a hard thing she's going to go through, but it's really like to help someone else. And uh, she, basically, before she goes in, she's like everything's going to be okay, <laughs> and then everything is not okay. So it, it kind of hit harder. I, I would say the only thing is like maybe adding just a little bit more of those hints um, because it was like a total shock to me. It just didn't feel like that kind of story, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and especially in a long, I mean, this is a short piece, so it doesn't really matter like too much. But in a longer piece, right? Um, if you go into a story and it's one way, and then it turns out that by the end it's the complete other direction, it's like all the people that would have liked the other direction are already gone because mm-hmm. they didn't like the first part, and all the people that like the first part don't like the ending, yeah. right? I mean, 
in a short piece like this, th- that is not the case. Yeah. But I'm just using it as a and, uh, point to talk about that. And on the topic of the relationship, uh, I did also notice what you what you said previously that um, a lot of time is spent on what he is willing to do for for her, but it's never like what she is willing to to do for him. And I think you know to kind of fortify that that section, uh, it would have been nice to at least give us as the audience a reason as to why she is actually with him beyond the the things that he does for for her and also if that is the only re- reason then make that plain yeah but uh i really really like this um for i, I mean i i love the characterization stuff i love the the bloody stuff yeah. it was very uncomfortable I, I think that was well done of course um but all right so these are the 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 wonderful people that uh were selected this week again reminder every time you write your chance of uh getting selected goes up uh we want to get a shout out to everyone who wrote this week uh thank you guys so much uh so thank you to uh Zach Atigi. thank you no goodbye Thank you, Ghost Pac-Man 4. Thank you, Ace of Sword. Thank you, Captain Rhino. Thank you, Kasubalu V2. Thank you, Hunt of the Heron. Thank you, Sarah Penguin. Thank you, One Mary Lilac. I know that uh, I think you haven't written in a while, so it's really, really good to to see you uh, come back. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for coming back. And uh, thank you, Paradox. And finally, thank you, Will Babe, who I believe is a new writer. So Ooh. thanks so much for joining us. Yes. And also, we, we want to give a shout out to all the people who left comments uh, by leaving a comment, not not only are you fortifying deeper understanding of your own work and also providing someone else with really great feedback, uh, but an added bonus, or should we say a incentive to actually comment, is that you also get one more ticket in the drawing for your story for that week. Um, so mm-hmm. thank you very much, Ace of Sword. Thank you, Captain Rhino again. Thank you, Sarah Penguin. Thank you, Hunt of the Heron. Thank you, Paradox. And thank you, Kasu Blue V2. You guys did a really great job. It was, it was awesome seeing all the, the back and forths uh, between authors and, and, and commenters. It's always super enjoyable to see that you're kind of... I mean, I think everyone learns whenever you guys do that. Yeah, exactly. It's great. Uh, and if you want to be like all of these wonderful writers for this week, then you can go to our subreddit, which is slash r r slash do the right thing, uh, and just go to whatever week you you want to write on, whether that's a previous one or the most recent one, and uh, set a timer for 30 minutes and use three of the four words for that week. That's right, uh, which will be announced at the end of this uh, podcast. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you don't have a Reddit account or you want to send us a- any sort of comment, you can send us an email at rightthinkcast at gmail.com. We're getting better about actually checking that, I promise. <laughs> uh, I, I really apologize for, for not seeing that stuff. Exactly. Or you can uh, leave a comment in the uh, discussion threads, uh, which are now being posted more or less consistently on the subreddit. Nice. And also, if you want to have as much time as possible... Uh, to, to see the words, uh, and also if we just want to keep up to date with any changes or anything that's going on with this uh, podcast that you enjoy listening to, you, you can go to our Twitter, which is at RightThingCast. That's right. Um, all right. Um, let's talk about uh, do stuff. So, so just some, some, some announcements that are, that are pretty big. Yes. Um, as we know, um, Wild Bo's work, Pale, has has begun. It's fantastic. It's so good. Um, <laughs> uh, and so our obligatory uh, Duke podcast has has sprouted as well. Uh, Elliot and Ruben are doing Pale Reflections, um, uh, going basically, I think, two chapters a, an episode, more or less. Okay. Um, uh, following along with the work, the first episode was great. It's it's really interesting seeing them balance their, their packed knowledge because Pale is set in the same universe, but not a sequel. Um <laughs> The, the Pale Reflections is a completely spoiler-free podcast. Um, they might have a section um, at the end where they uh, talk about packed knowledge stuff, but it will be very clearly separate from the main portion. Uh-huh. You, you won't stumble upon that by accident, so don't worry about spoilers. And they actually had um, they had some guests on who have not read Pact. It was Elliot Sisters, uh-huh. just to make sure that like they could talk about stuff that they normally wouldn't be able to talk about because they have too much information that would influence their answers. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. They do such a great job. Yeah, they, they do a fantastic job. Also, another great thing happening in the Doof Network that involves uh, Do the Right Thing's very own Matthias Mason is that you are starting a uh, newish pod podcasting 
adventure named Decomposing Worm, where you'll be revisiting Worm and, and, and all those things. So, yeah, talk to us about that. Yeah, I'm super, super excited. We announced that on uh, We've Got Ward. I think I was pretty awkward on there, but it's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you weren't. Uh, I got... I, I, I got um, I was kind of in the middle of something when I got called, and, and so I was startled and scatterbrained, and I should have just, like, not answered immediately and just been like, okay, get your brain together. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so so uh, Clarence and I um, are, are starting this new podcast, Decomposing Worm. We're basically going to be uh, analyzing Worm in uh, some, some pretty big chunks, uh, basically, like, 200 to 3,000 word, like, books of Worm um, uh, every other week. Uh, and we are applying a lot of like literary theories and, and we're basically be writing essays, um, on, uh, each of those books. Um, what's cool about it is that it's a set time frame. Uh, I don't know. I haven't checked when the last episode's episode is going to be released, but it's going to be three months. We're going to do, uh, 12 episodes and cover six books. Uh, but I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, the feed should be on everything at this point. Nice. It's on YouTube. It's on uh, Stitcher, it's on Spotify, it's on every other podcatcher. So, um, if you've read Worm and don't mind uh, us talking about it some more, because there's always more that we can say about Wild Bo's uh, classic parahuman story, um, you can subscribe to that feed and uh, see what we create next week. We'll, we're, we're posting every Friday, starting the week that this episode comes out. So exactly, and yeah, I'm, I'm uh, super super excited. If you're in the same boat that that I am, someone who has faith uh, faithfully not read Worm. Uh, this will be the perfect opportunity to, to really jump in. I know Worm is something that I've always really wanted to, to take the time to actually read. So this will be the perfect opportunity to read it and then also have some of your best boys uh, talking about it. So really, really great stuff. And I'm really proud and excited to see what you do come up with, Matthias. Thank you so much. Uh, I am in- very excited as well. So, <laughs> I, we've written the the first scripts and they are incredibly long. So now we're in the process of like right. cutting them down. Well, I mean, um, but yeah, it's going to be fantastic. Since since we're you're part of the Doof Network, uh, <laughs> isn't long the new normal? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're we're aiming for every episode to to like be exactly like two hours, but we'll see how that goes, or less. You know, maybe uh-huh. possibly. <laughs> I mean, uh, every book is going to get two whole episodes, so. Hopefully, between the two of them, we can each each book is going to get four hours of conversation. Yeah. Right? So hopefully, but between all that, it doesn't spill over to be even more than that. Try we're trying not to be become hardcore history and have like eight hour <laughs> podcasts. That's a little bit much. Uh, but all right. Uh, the the last thing that we are uh, going to say is, of course, if you want to support us, there's there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash doofmedia and uh, donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Um, that lets us, you know, purchase equipment. We are, we're able to purchase a microphone for uh, Clarence mm-hmm. and uh, get a new, pay for the hosting fees for the new podcast that way. So it's only because of the generosity of our patrons that we can do that, uh, especially because us college students are, are broke enough without having to pay for hobby equipment. Exactly, so, yeah. I've been uh, trying uh, to pull as as much money to together to get the adobe suite <laughs> yeah and that's proving to be yeah, like a six month journey and uh depending on the level you of course get uh some some great rewards at the five dollar level you get to watch our doof and chills which is going on i think the the day that this comes out mm-hmm. monday at 9 30 p.m uh me and scott brian from we want more and who else oh and matt of course we are going to be playing uh left 4 dead 2 so that's gonna be some some fun stuff yeah. and uh another little little touch um at the ten dollar level we're, we're finally like really uh working on providing like specific rewards for that level and we are uh, and matt freeman is already releasing uh freeman bros which is kind of um the, the recordings of uh him and his uh brother's conversations as they kind of talk about in depth about a topic it's 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 really cool um i'm really enjoying those um and maybe some some content in in the future uh maybe a jarvis and i might defend madoka magica who who knows who knows (laughs) there is no might about it even if it's not on the podcast i will rep that show to the day i die (laughs) i think i will too um (laughs) and uh if if you 
don't have the the money to, to donate, don't worry. We totally understand. Uh, but you can go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you're listening and leave a rating and review. Um, a, a lot of algorithms are really uh, based off of, you know, what kind of reviews you get. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pleased that we're a five-star rated podcast, Woo! but we also don't have any reviews to read. Um, and, and we'll at the we'll, we'll read out your review, um, <laughs> of course. So, yeah, we, we truly appreciate it. Um, I mean, I, I went on a re- reviewing binge and I just reviewed every single podcast I listened to, um, just got it done one day and, uh, now I don't feel bad about it. So yeah, and I mean, I doing that is super helpful. Uh, and also a, another way to help us out. If this is a podcast that you really like, maybe you listen to it religiously or whenever you, you do find <laughs> the, the time. But, uh, if this is something that you really dig, uh, the best way to kind of help us out is to, just by word of mouth. Uh, tell someone that you think might be interested in this podcast about us. Um, it's the best way to really get our name out and get it uh, around, and it'll be heavily appreciated from the right thing, bros. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to tell like your mom about it, but you know, maybe uh, tell your writer friend, or if your mom is trying to be a writer, maybe then tell her actually. So <laughs> who knows? Um, all right, <laughs> let's let's finish off this podcast. Jarvis, what are the words next week? The words for next week are drum roll, please. Thank you for the drum roll. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> and the words for for next week are wrestle, rush, central, discourage. So uh, wrestle, as in to like to wrestle. Yeah, to, to physically wrestle with a person or I guess a concept, you could do that too. Rush, as in to rush from one place to another. Premium um, rush. I think it also um, you could say rushes of reads, like. Like reads are called rushes, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's probably some some other meanings that I don't know myself. Uh, central, something that is the center of something. Or also uh, a lot of times there's a trope of the soldiers in the field uh, calling central. That's like the base, right? Yeah. So potentially you, you could do that. Um, and discourage to uh, not, to, to, to make someone uh, less... Yeah, to, to, to not, the opposite of encourage <laughs> someone to do something. <laughs> to not courage. Um, yes, yes. Um, all right, uh, Jarvis, what story are you going to write? Well, next week I'm not not going to be writing. That's your job. But uh, yes, that's I, true. I, I will play around with the idea of of the uh, central in the field of, of battle, who has sadly mm-hmm. actually lost faith uh, in his soldiers. Um, th- they used to be a a very rowdy bunch and he was perfectly fine with this as long as they got their their job done but as soon as the floodgates of of war opened they started dropping like like flies and and one Mm -hmm. by one they all fell until the central his himself was discouraged by this war and by the sheer loss of 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 life so he decides to actually join all of his soldiers and be on the battlefield with them and then in this glorious ending they all rush towards the the castle storming it bombing it and trying their their best to win this this war for their side and it, and it all comes to a head where when this central has to wrestle the most evil and malevolent Man- being ever adolf hitler <laughs> i like how you, you took what i said about calling the the base central and you just named a position central yes <laughs> um yes he is central. Uh, yeah so i I'll, I'll be i'll be following that same thing uh next week we are uh going to be doing uh focusing on action so consider writing an action story uh my story is going to be about uh two uh sumo wrestlers uh Ooh. circling around the the sumo ring um the uh the one in green who are, we are following um he uh, roars to discourage his uh, enemy from approaching the same way. Uh, and then as soon as he kind of the, his opponent uh, reacts, he rushes uh, into the, 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 to, to the center, uh, to, to the central ring of, of, the, of the sumo arena. And uh, they are uh, they, they smash together and they're, they're wrestling with, with each other um, 
after he rushed in and but it turns out that our our green sumo wrestler has actually cheated because he has um kind of like sticky grips on the bottom of his feet <laughs> that are like flesh colored so Ugh. like you can't tell but he's like firmly planted on the ground and he wrestles with his enemy pushes him off the field he tumbles and like falls into the audience <laughs> and uh, stuff happens and uh our 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 green one this is uh announced the winner and uh, takes all the winnings home and then uh buys a small country wow so so he did all this by cheating yes wow well i mean cheating is a horrible thing but one thing that you can't cheat on is doing the right thing that's right <laughs> excellent Okay, that works. Okay.